All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our, our webinar here. My name is Patrick Joyce, and I am an associate based out of Seifarth Seattle office, but I do a lot of work in the California realm. And we're here to talk to you about uh, Seifarth's 2021 Cal Peculiarities Series 2, Cal OSHA ETS, uh, Hero Pay throughout California, also known as Hazard Pay, and industry specific new rehire laws. A little bit of housekeeping to start off. Um, all participants are going to be in listen only mode. If you have any questions throughout the program, please use the Q&A section, which is located on the right hand side of your WebEx window. Uh, we'll do our best to get to everyone's questions and we're going to have a 10 minute Q&A session following our presentation. But if we're unable to get to your question, uh, we'll follow up by email and um, address the question at that point in time. Additionally, we'll be, oh, I already said this, it's in the script. All right, um, for those who are interested in CLE credit, an attendance verification code is going to be read by Chantel during the presentation towards the end of the presentation. Uh, please write the code down or take note of it because it won't be repeated and it's going to be required for CLE credit. Um, the CLE credit submission instructions, the presentation recording, and the slide deck that we're going to use during the presentation will be distribu distributed to attendees in a, uh, the next couple of days following the presentation. All right, next slide, please. All right, we have our required uh, legal disclaimer here for everybody. This will also be included in the, uh, in the presentation slides. Today, we're going to hear from uh, Chantel Egan, who is a partner in our San Francisco office, as well as Elizabeth Levy, who is a partner in our uh, Los Angeles Century City office. And then also myself, and I'm going to kick off the presentation. Uh, and as I said, I'm based out of Seattle, but just recently moved uh, within the last couple of months from our Chicago office. Next slide, please. Here's an overview of the presentation. Uh, as I said, it's gonna be Cal OSHA requirements, hazard pay, and then industry specific right to recall laws. Next slide, please. Okay. So I'm sure everybody has been deeply involved or deeply paying attention to the um, long saga that has been this Cal OSHA uh, emergency temporary standard regarding COVID-19. It originally went into place at the end of November of 2020. And since that time, there have been numerous question and answers, Q and A's uh, put out by Cal OSHA. Finally, towards the end of May, uh, Cal OSHA started to think about revamping it to account for some of the new guidance that has come out from uh, CDPH, from the US CDC and, and other organizations. Uh, so on, on June 11th, Cal OSHA proposed revisions, and this is actually a second set of pr proposed revisions. I'm not going to go through the entire process. It would take the whole uh, the whole 30 minutes, um, which were these, these proposed revisions were approved on June the 17th. And actually, rather than waiting the 10 days that were they were supposed to under the law, uh, the, the governor, Ms. Governor Newsom, uh, put in a, an executive order that made them effective immediately on June 17th. So the, the, the main things I'm going to talk about in my portion of the presentation are just the important changes and the important items that remain in place from the previous set of, of ETS requirements. This could be an entire hour long presentation on its own, but we're gonna fit it in here just because we know everybody is, is quite interested in, in this topic. It's a very hot topic right now. One of the most important changes that Cal OSHA made was to the quarantine and exclusion requirements for fully vaccinated employees. Um, this has to do with if someone's a close contact or if they're identified as being in a workplace where someone uh, had, had, been, had shown up, a non-vaccinated employee or another person had shown up with COVID symptoms. The change is that these individuals and also individuals who are 90 days out from having um, recovered from COVID-19 do not have to be excluded from the workplace. And they also do not have to be provided with the testing 
that is required to be provided for other employees who may not be fully vaccinated. The other thing that I think this is maybe the, the hottest part of the, uh, of the revisions to the ETS is the update in the face coverings guidance. And CDPH on the 15th, I think it was of June came out with updated guidance for um, the public. And it said for fully vaccinated employee or uh, individuals, they did not have to mask up indoors. Um, Cal OSHA quickly adopted this, uh, kind of seemed like a little haphazard, but they quickly adopted it. And at this point in time, face coverings are not required for fully vaccinated employees indoors or for any employees outdoors, except in certain circumstances. To be able to remove a face covering indoors, the Calosha, the ETS requires that employers get documentation of the employee's vaccinated status. And that can be through a number of different ways. Calosha gives a couple of examples. It is not an exclusive or an exhaustive list, I should say, um, but it's getting a, a viewing the vaccination card. That's certainly one way. A lot of clients don't want to do that because they don't want to have to maintain the vaccination card itself. Um, you can also get a self attestation, like a signed statement from the employee saying that they are fully vaccinated. You can also make a list of employees that have indicated or provided uh, information to an employer in some way that they are fully vaccinated. The important thing is that this information has to be maintained confidentially and has to be maintained separately from an employee's regular file. And it can't be just passed around to everybody. It has to be kept within a, a, a tight group to maintain that confidentiality. Uh, one of the exceptions to uh, masking in outdoors, I should say, is for mass gatherings. And that's a, that's a defined term in the ETS. And also indoors for all employees, if a, an employer meets what's called the outbreak status. And again, I, as I said, I could go on for, for an hour about all of this. Um, but if, there, if an employer meets the outbreak status, which is three confirmed cases within a 14 day window, then everybody has to return to wearing the mask indoors. Um, another thing that just came out, I think it was either earlier this week or late last week, Los Angeles County has now put in place a recommendation not a requirement, but a recommendation that even fully vaccinated individuals wear masks indoors. And uh, their basis for that is, is this Delta variant that I'm sure we've all been hearing about. But just keep in mind at this point, this is just a recommendation and not a requirement. Another thing that was removed from the prior ETS was physical distancing. And in a little bit of a surprise move, Cal OSHA removed the, the physical distancing requirement for all employees, regardless of vaccination status, unless you're in that outbreak status that I was talking about, or the employer has some reason to believe that there is a specific hazard presented by being in close proximity. And that's part of the ETS, if you may recall, the, the underlying one of the remaining requirements is that you have to do a hazard uh, analysis to determine what specific hazards are there. If the employer determines that the physical distancing is going to be a hazard, then they need to address that appropriately. Next slide, please. One of the um, items that was a, a bit controversial throughout the process of the revisions to the ETS was this idea that that non vaccinated employees, or I should say, employees who are not fully vaccinated because it covers folks who have received only one shot in a two shot sequence, they can request respiratory protection from the employer and the employer has to provide it to them within a reasonable period of time, which has not been fully defined yet, but I, I presume there's going to be more guidance coming out about what reasonable period of time is. Um, the example that Cal OSHA provided in the in the FAQs and in all the materials that they have have put out on their website is an N95 and it has to be a NIOSH approved respirator. So for those of you who don't know, a KN95 would not be a NIOSH approved respirator, but an N95 if it has the little NIOSH symbol on it would be a, a, an approved respirator. 
for those of you who are thinking, oh gosh, now I have to do a respiratory protection program for my employees. That's not the case under the ETS. You still do have to provide training to employees on how to properly put on and take off this respiratory protection, as well as do what they call a seal check to make sure they're getting a good seal. And also, um, you know, how to make sure that they're clean and, and maintained in good condition, but you will not have to put together a full respiratory protection program. One of the, the things that's good about this revision from what was pre previously proposed from Kalosh is that the prior version had an affirmative requirement for employers to provide N95s to employees. Now it's been pulled back to just if requested by an employee. The last kind of major uh, item is there's a requirement in the revisions to evaluate the ventilation within the, your facility. It doesn't really go into what are you supposed to do once you evaluate the, the ventilation, but basically you need to make sure that if, if you have control over your ventilation in your facility, it's operating properly, efficiently, fully, you're bringing in as much outdoor makeup air as possible. If you don't have um, the ability to control your own ventilation, say you rent an office building or something like that, uh, you're going to have to work with your landlord or the, the, the owner of the building to make sure that happens. Next slide, please. And, and as I said before, there are a lot of other smaller changes to this from the revisions. Um, so if you do have any follow-up questions, any one of us on this call on this presentation can answer them. Um, and we'll, we'll show you the slide again with our, our contact information at the end. Some of the items that remain in place from the prior ETS version from November of 2020 that are being carried through into this new version is the COVID-19 prevention program and all of the associated hazard assessments and reviews that are necessary. Cal OSHA did uh, yesterday release a, an updated model CPP that does take into account the revisions in, of, the, of the ETS. So I would say it's a good idea, a good best practice for you go to Kalosha's website and it's down towards the bottom. You can download the Word version of the CPP and start filling it in with sp information that's specific to your establishment. If you have a CPP from the prior version of the ETS, you'll wanna go and at least download the, the updated model program to make sure that you incorporate the changes into your prior CPP. Uh, Kalosha still requires training of employees under the, ET, the revised ETS. It's essentially the same, but of course, some of the requirements have changed in the ETS itself. You need to make sure that employees are aware of the hazards presented by COVID-19, how they can identify and work with those hazards and many, many other items which are listed out in the ETS, but also, again, helpfully, somewhat unlike Kalosha, um, Kalosha is going to be preparing uh, model kind of training materials that employers can use to, to make sure they're following the requirements. One of the other things that stays in this version of the CPP uh, and of the ETS is employee screening is still required. Uh, employers are still required to put forth a program that makes sure that employees who are sick or ill or have symptoms stay out of the workplace. So that is something that stays. A lot of states have actually been getting rid of that. So be careful if you have operations in multiple states to keep it going in California. Um, exclusion of symptomatic individuals and, symptom and symptomatic close contacts is still required, even if you are fully vaccinated. So if an employee is fully vaccinated but symptomatic, they must be excluded from the workplace. There's some outbreak reporting requirements that are still uh, in, in place in the, the revised version of the ETS where you have to notify um, the, the health department under a separate law. It's, you might know it as AB 685, that's how we refer to it, but it has to do with reporting these types of situations to the health department. And then also employee notification requirements remain in place where you have to notify other employees who were in the workplace at the same time as the um, as a, an individual who may have been sick. And, and finally, um, one of the things that a lot of us have been kind of wringing our hands over is this, in, this idea of exclusion pay. And I don't have it on my document here, but um, if, if you have a, a person who's being kept out because they're a close contact, 
or they are a COVID-19 case as defined in the ETS, they have to, you have to maintain their pay and benefits and everything like that as set out in the, the document itself. Unless you can prove that that individual was not um, exposed to COVID-19, it was not a, a work-related COVID-19 outbreak or uh, uh, illness. Um, okay, I, my apologies, Elizabeth, I've gone a little bit over my time, but uh, I'm gonna kick it to you next. Thanks, Patrick. That's that's a lot. I, it's a lot to squeeze into a few minutes. Um, on the, I guess I'll, that's actually the exclusion pay is a nice sort of piggyback because it's complicated. You need to interweave it with California state and local regulations, which sort of leads a, a bit further to this section of it of uh, the presentation, which I'll I'll go over some of the California hazard pay ordinances. But I think that um, you know an overarching headline for for this for California in general, for California local, both non-COVID and COVID-related sick pay, is that location matters. Um, you know, I know at the at the top of the presentation, Patrick explained that um, you know this presentation is a bit of an offshoot of our annual Cal Peculiarities publication, which just goes into all of the ways in which California law is just different. It just it just is in many many ways, and then even within California. There are so many different local laws, and I think that um, COVID-related ordinances have really pushed that to to a head. And you just see it. So actually, if you flip to the next slide, and then we can flip back. But um, I just to sort of visually see these are all of the cities and counties that have enacted some kind of hazard pay ordinance. It's a lot. All of them are very different. They, they, some of them, it's two dollars, three dollars, four dollars, five dollars. They all, you know, some of them explicitly include or exclude different types of employees. So I can't really impress enough how much um, these local ordinances, especially with respect to COVID, are just they're they're popping up everywhere. They're all over the place. They are not uniform. Um, they're not always. The most clearly written pieces of, of legislation. Um, so I, just just to sort of visually lay this out, I just wanted to to provide. I mean, it is a helpful list if you have um, if you have businesses that are operating in any of these places that may be impacted. It's just a helpful reference point. This is certainly not an exhaustive list of every single location that has considered these ordinances or that may consider them. Um, but if we can just sort of flip back to the first slide, I'll. I'll dig into the to the nuts and bolts a little bit more. So these hazard pay ordinances started cropping up um, towards the beginning of 2021. They generally apply to grocery stores. Some of them also apply to pharmacies. You need to be very, very careful if you're operating in the sphere to, in this sphere to see if something actually applies. So some of them have very specific square footage requirements. Some of them, you have to look at whether a certain percentage of the sales floor includes certain types of grocery. You just, bottom line, be careful. Some some carve out convenience stores, um, but if you have, if you're operating any type of store that's selling grocery, foodstuffs, um, certain pharmacies, make sure that you you're taking a look to see if you're in need to comply with any of these. Um, and as I mentioned, so the, the different ordinances, sometimes they will explicitly say that managers don't need to be getting this additional hazard pay. Sometimes it's a little bit ambiguous as to what that means. So for example, if you have a non-existent, um, or I'm sorry, a non-exempt assistant manager who, it, it's unclear sometimes whether somebody like that would be subject to the pay. So, I, you know, I think a good a good rule of thumb is sort of, you know, when in doubt, sometimes um, you know, sometimes it's helpful to actually get in touch with the the county, or maybe have you know have your your attorney um, reach out to the county. Sometimes you can get clarification directly from the the people that are issuing these. Um, but you also just you know want to make sure that you're having this additional pay apply to the right people in the right way. And along those lines, this kind of, these these hazard pay ordinances can create a bit of a headache in terms of regular rate and sick pay and wage statement. So if somebody's getting an additional, say, $5 per hour, you may need to make adjustments 
that you know, if they're working overtime hours, you may need to make some adjustments there to, to make sure that the regular rate is properly calculated. And similarly, with respect to sick pay, so sick pay I could probably talk about for, I don't know, hours, I won't do it, but it's, it's complicated. And the rate of pay um, under both state and Sydney ordinances can be, can be complicated. Sometimes it's the, the regular rate, sometimes you're using this 90 day look back where you're looking at total wages over a certain period of time. So just remember as you're calculating your sick pay, if, you ha if you're subject to hazard pay, make sure that it's incorporated properly. And same thing with wage statements, you wanna make sure that, um, that your wage statements are up to snuff, that if you have hazard pay on your wage statements that it's appropriately listed um, and that you're you know, generally complying with all of the 226 wage statement requirements. Um, another another sort of wrinkle that's come in with some of these ordinances is that they're creating these pay time off either options or obligations. So um, a couple of these ordinances have given employers the option to, instead of paying hazard pay, they can provide employees with a certain amount of additional paid time off. Um, maybe worth considering. And then for a few of these, there's been some sort of additional vaccine related paid leave slipped in there um so again it, you know unfortunately it really is just a massive massive patchwork of different types of ordinances and state laws that you'll just need to sort of go down the line and make sure you're in compliance um you know record keeping requirements so some of these ordinances specifically require you to maintain records for a certain period of time you you may just want to make sure that you're retaining records um in accordance with your general practices, I think a lot of folks retain things for at least four years, but if there's a specific requirement, keep an eye out for that. Some of these ordinances also have very specific notice requirements. So sometimes a city will say, we're going to publish a notice, you have to put it up in your break room or you have to distribute it to employees. Sometimes it needs to be in, you know, in English and Spanish and any language spoken by, you know, 5% or more of the workforce, these are just very, some of these notice requirements are very specific. Um, it's just, again, something else to keep an eye out for. Another, another thing that's just a bit tricky administratively is that some of these ordinances have been passed as, as regular ordinances and as urgency ordinances, and that can impact the dates that they become effective and can impact the dates that they expire. So it's, I mean, frankly, it's just a bit difficult with certain, certain localities, um, sometimes they want to extend things, they take positions that things haven't really expired, even though on the face of it, it seems like maybe it has. So just be very careful before you stop providing hazard pay to make sure that any ordinance has actually expired. Um, when, this, when this first started coming out, there were a lot of waves, um, a lot of legal challenges so far to date, none of those have, have held, um, but, there are certainly challenges to these to these hazard pay ordinances, and we can we can flip to the next slide. So, um, just a couple other points here. So, they're very like I said, it's the the exact locality is very important, and it you have to really actually take a look at the exact you know street view of where your business may be. Sometimes you have to look at very specific county zoning and whether you're in an incorporated part of the county or not um it's very very granular so it just make sure that if if you're you, you really probably do need to actually look at the exact address to figure out if some of these ordinances apply and then just a word of warning i know that we're you know we're focused on california here but there are certain states and cities and localities outside of California that have considered these types of ordinances that are enacting these types of ordinances. So it sort of seems like it seems like it started on the West Coast and is sort of spreading around the country a bit. Um, some places have rejected them, but just something to, something to keep an eye out for if you have a national presence in, a, in an industry where you might be impacted by these types of ordinances. And with that, I will kick it off to Chantal. Hey, everybody. So I'm here to talk about uh, the right to recall laws. Um, some of these started on a much sort of localized level. And in April, the state of California swept in and created a, um, a statewide law covering right to recall. This is 
and in that sense, like a, in, a, in a nutshell, what right to recall means is that if you've let somebody go, there is an order of preference for bringing them back. And this is all tied back to COVID. So if there's a rationale for having let someone go due to the COVID pandemic, there's now a law um, that is detailing how it is and who it is that you can bring back to work. Um, now, this is incredibly industry specific, so this does not apply to every employer. It only applies to certain employers, which I've listed here. And really the, the, the thrust here is that these are for the most part hospitality, travel, and then service providers, and in particular, janitorial services, um, building maintenance, and things of that nature. Um, and, and really what it keys into is these are the industries that had to make, um, had typically had layoffs as a result of COVID, and that's why the law addresses them here. Additionally, it doesn't cover every single employee that was impacted by a layoff for COVID. Um, it's only going to impact employees that prior to January 1, 2020, so even you know, pre-COVID, had already worked for the employer for at least six months during the 12, 12 months prior. So in the prior year, had worked at least six months. So if you have somebody that you know had worked for you three years ago and then came back and worked for three uh, months in 2019, they would not apply. Um, as a covered laid off employee. But I also think it's really important to think about the difference between furloughed and terminated. And you really have to be mindful that in the state of California, there is technically no such thing as being furloughed. Um, and so if you furloughed an employee you, and you fall under one of these categories, you certainly wanna think long and hard about whether it would be considered a layoff um, underneath, uh, under the eyes of the law, for example, that you do a war notice or something like that, because if so, then this law is likely triggered. Go to the next slide. So now the big question is, is we're all kind of roaring back and as Patrick's, you know, uh, section really highlighted that things are changing and I'm sure you're all experiencing this in your own lives, that things are opening back up. And with that, um, employers are deciding that they want to bring employees back. Um, so the, the question is, what do I do? And really what this law details is a set process of how to bring people back. Um, and it makes sense that being it covers a process that there is a carve out for collective bargaining agreements. Now, if you have a collective bargaining agreement that doesn't automatically um, kick you out of the running, if you will, of a needing to comply with this statute, this is something that you, know, you need to cover with the union and, uh, and have expressly uh, covered in your, in your agreement. But assuming that there is no um, CBA um, that covers this issue, then the loss kicks in. And first things first is that you need to bring back a qualified laid off employee in order of seniority. Now, the concept of being qualified is always a little bit tricky. Like, what does that exactly mean? Um, so what that means is that this person was performing a similar job to the role that is now open, and you need to um, give that person the opportunity to come back before you hire somebody else. Now, what do you do if you have employers, or rather employees, that they're all similar, and they all could or be qualified employees? That's when it becomes necessary to rank them in terms of seniority. And the seniority though, and this is important, is about the seniority with your company. It's not that you have been a, you know, a particular uh, hotel industry e expert for you know, two decades. It's how long you've actually been with that employer. But it is all right for you to contemporaneously push out a bunch of offer letters for qualified employees. Now, Within the five days that those employees are permitted to respond and keep in mind it's business days, which the law defines as weekdays, except for holidays, holidays are also excluded. Um, then, you know, so you have 10 spots and 20 people say, yes, I want my job back. Then once again, you go through this process of the seniority, giving the job to the individual who uh, has the most seniority with the company. Um, now, if somebody, now an employer, an employee rather, is not qualified for an open role, 
there's and you're going to go ahead and you're going to hire somebody else, then the employer has an obligation to create a written explanation within 30 days of hiring that new hire. So, of course, on top of everyone's mind, what happens if I inadvertently don't comply? The DLSC, which is the Department of uh, Labor Standards and Enforcement that handles wage and hour issues here in California, has exclusive enf enforcement jurisdiction. So this is not something that is going to be filed as a civil lawsuit. An employee that files a claim with the DLSC could be entitled to being hired or reinstatement rights, as well as getting front or back pay, along with any of the missed benefits. Additionally, the DLSC can also impose a $1,000 penalty on each impacted employee, which obviously um, adds up quite quickly if you have a lot of employees that are, are impacted by your, by your failure to comply with this, with this law. While this law was just enacted, it has a very long uh, life cycle. It's going to expire um, in December of 2024. So um, this is certainly something that you need to keep on your radar um, in terms of compliance, because this is not going to be something that is quickly sunsetted. To go to the next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, there was already local ordinances in play when the state statute uh, came to be. And as you can see here, there's four in Southern California and there is three um, in Northern California. Um, and in many ways, these local statutes or local ordinances follow pretty similarly what it is that the state says. But you really need to be careful to look into the local nuances. I feel like, you know, Elizabeth and I are harping on the same issue. Like, don't think just because you're complying with um, California law that you're good to go. First of all, the, that issue of qualified employee, there really is some nuances with each of the um, each of the local uh, local ordinances, even if they're all covering, for example, um, you know, all covering hotels. Um, likewise, if there's anything that is more rigorous than the uh, state statute, the state statute was very express and said that it does not supersede these local ordinances. And if there is a higher standard locally, you must comply. And just to quickly, because I know we are probably, um, I'm, I'm only two minutes over, that's pretty good considering. Um, I just want to run down very quickly um, some of the high level local ordinances uh, discrepancies that I want you to be thinking about as you navigate this issue. Um, San Francisco in particular has a much broader category of industries that um, fall under its uh, what used to be a temporary emergency ordinance and is now a, um, a more permanent ordinance um, has many more industries. In particular, it has restaurants. If there is uh, 200 employees in a single establishment, it has grocery stores, large service, food service operations, formal retail establishments. So that's the, you know, the, your local retail shop that you recognize because it um, has a brand that you recognize. Um, and then also any four, um, for-profit or non-profit that has at least 100 employees worldwide. And if they, if those particular organizations had 10 or more employees in a 30-day period during, in essence, our COVID window, if they were laid off, those um, employers also have to comply. So it's a much, much broader reach. Um, additionally, in both San Francisco and San Diego, there needs to be notice at the time of the termination, at the time of the layoff, that this is a right and that the employee who's just been laid off should um, be aware of their rights under this particular law for recall. Um, additionally, the, the qualified employees and the recall process for LA, Long Beach and Oakland are very, very similar. Um, but notably with all three of these is that it's being qualified does not mean that you are necessarily performing a similar function as the as a new open role, but rather that you are capable of being trained to perform that job. Um, and it requires employees um, to tr or rather employers to train um, formerly laid off employees um, so that they can become qualified. Um, 
I would say that the, you know, the other thing to be really kind of mindful is, is that in San Francisco, which is a, an unusual nuance, is that there is a requirement that if accommodations are needed, for example, an alternative work schedule or something like that, in order for a qualified employee to return to work, those accommodations should be, uh, uh, should be uh, considered and very likely granted. LA is the, uh, of the local ordinances, is the first one that's likely to sunset. It has a reevaluation in March of next year in 2022, at which time a report will be created to determine whether or not um, the ordinance will continue. But many of these other local ordinances have a long shelf life. Now, with that said, um, you know, we've given you quite a bit of information, so I want to give you your CLE code. Oh, which I, is it, my apologies, it's not in the slide. Is there a CLE code? Elsewhere, if not, Roya, can you step in and give the I have CLE it. code? I have it, Shento. Oh, thank um, you. It's SS as in Seifarth Shaw, 8392. Again, that's SS 8392. Thanks, Patrick. Way to save the day. Um, you deserve hero pay. Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> And now, let's just give you an update on what's coming up. Um, we have quite a few uh, webinar series to cover California particularities this year because there's just so many things that are um, that are new and interesting. Uh, we have two more on the table. Uh, one is next Wednesday, which is independent contractor industries, and next the one after that is rounding and meal periods. You certainly should join all of them and feel free to register for any of those webinars when you get the slides that uh, link will be live and you can and you can uh, register to attend. Now, with that said, if anyone has any, oh, there's also our, you'll also receive links for our CalPEX book and you can download the CalPEX uh, PDF from last year um, as well as just sign up for our mailing list. And I also just want to give a huge plug for our CalPEX blog. It is phenomenal. We are constantly pushing out content, um, and it really is um, quite up to date. Uh, award and winning too, right, Chantel? It's award winning. It is award winning. It is award winning, and we all are authors on this blog. So kudos to us. Um, and so we have a couple of questions that have come through. So I want to use the last couple minutes that we have. Um, to address some of these. Uh, and so I'm just gonna actually kind of read these out and um, and the appropriate person will, will, will grab these. Um, but before I forget, this webinar is being recorded and you'll be able to watch it later on and you will receive the slide deck. So um, Patrick, uh, is Cal OSHA expected to issue a template attestation like Santa Clara County? I, I saw this question pop up and I have not heard anything. They did issue a, a draft or a model CPP, but no, I have not seen or heard of them um, uh, issuing a an attestation. But uh, we, we're happy mm -hmm. to work with you on, on that if you need, a, need one of those. We've done many of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would say too that Santa Clara actually recently amended its law and is rolling yes. back this attestation requirement. So for those of you in Santa Clara County, as long as you've complied with two rounds, meaning for those who are not fully vaccinated, have pinged them twice, um, then you will have complied with the uh, Santa Clara requirement. In essence, they're moonlighting it um, following the Cal OSHA, the Cal OSHA rules. Um, there's also a question that would be for me about, you know, if an employee was laid off due to other reasons, not COVID related, would that apply? The key thing here when it's not COVID related, um, that's when you really need to take a hard look at whether or not you can make an argument that it's not COVID related. So for example, there is an economic downturn, you were doing great and then COVID happened and your uh, your hotel is now empty, but we're gonna lay everybody off. No one, none of my customers are there. And you may say, oh, well, I laid people off because we don't have any customers. You really need to, you know, go to the root cause in order to ensure that you are not um, uh, stepping uh, into an area that where there may be liability. So my advice to you is, you know, certainly think critically about the rationale for any layoff. Likewise, you also want to be thinking about because with any layoff, you will have gone through the process of determining, you know, what is the business case for doing this layoff. 
Um, so you really want to look back at, at your materials um, and really make sure that you're capturing what the, the business thought in that moment in time, uh, instead of saying, you know, in retrospect, now knowing what we know, that we can make some arguments that it's not necessarily COVID related. Um, let's see. Oh, I did see one um, for me. There's all. Oh. oh, okay. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to jump on this one really, really quickly about providing N95s to employers. Uh, there was a question about whether the state will have a stockpile of them. I, I have heard that this may be a possibility, but for now, there's nothing concrete out there about having N95s available. What the state has done is assembled a list of companies that have at least, there's a list on their website, on Kalosh's website, of companies that have at least 100,000 and 95s in stock and it gives you the website to go to it gives you the number to call all of that and according to Kalosha they update it twice a day I think is what I heard them say recently who knows if it'll stay that that often because that's a lot of work but uh, at least as of mm -hmm. right now there's a list on their website that says these are the folks that have these in stock go go purchase them there mm -hmm. And and one last question that we had was about training, the requirement to train, which is um, implicated in LA, Long Beach, and Oakland for the right to recall. The training should not be extensive. The question is, do you have to, you know, help someone get a special degree or incredibly extensive training? Um, certainly, if there's an educational bar, that is not contemplated by these ordinances. Now, the ordinances are not uh, very, very specific, so I can't give you a perfectly black and white answer, but it needs to be a logical leap that while the person is not qualified with, you know, a reasonable amount of training, they could be become qualified. So a good example would be that, you know, someone has a similar position, but they don't know how to use a piece of equipment and you can train them on how to do it in a day or two. I think you'd be hard pressed to say that that person cannot be trained at least for purposes of that right to recall ordinance. Um, so with that, I really, we all really appreciate your time. We know that, um, you know, you have frankly many webinars to choose from. And so thank you uh, for spending time with us today. Um, and if you have any questions after you've you know, reviewed the webinar, um, any of our panelists are happy to help you.